Now we begin the formal program of the evening and the formal introduction, which is my duty. I start with that. The keynote and the main speaker for today, inshallah, is Dr. Zakir Abdul Karim Naik. He's the president of Islamic Research Foundation, the organization behind this whole conference going on before you for the last nine days with only one day balance. That's tomorrow. He's renowned as a dynamic international orator on Islam and comparative religion, mainly because he clarifies Islamic viewpoints and clears misconceptions about Islam using the Quran, authentic Hadith and other religious scriptures as a basis in conjunction with reason, logic and scientific facts. Dr. Zakir is popular for his critical analysis and convincing answers to challenging questions posed by audiences after his public talks. The reason we are exclusively having this session today evening. In the last 13 years, Dr. Zakir has delivered more than 1300 public talks worldwide in addition to many talks in India. He has successfully participated in symposia and dialogues with prominent personalities of other faiths and religions. His public dialogue with Dr. William Campbell of USA on the topic, the Quran and the Bible in the light of science, held in Chicago, USA on April 1st, 2000, was a resounding success in proving the compatibility of Quran with established science. Similarly, his interfaith dialogue with the famous guru, Sri Sri Ravi Shankar of India on the topic, the concept of God in Hinduism and Islam in the light of sacred scriptures held in Bangalore on 21st January 2006 was highly acclaimed for his propounding the concept of oneness of God Almighty. Dr. Zakir Naik recently stood out most eloquently for Islam and Muslims on one of the leading news channels of India, NDTV 24-7. In the interview, Walk the Talk, conducted by host Shekhar Gupta, who is the editor-in-chief of Indian Express. And this was telecast on the 7th and 8th March 2009 on NDTV. Dr. Zakir appears regularly on many international TV channels in over 200 countries worldwide. Hundreds of his talks, dialogues, debates and symposia are available on VCDs and DVDs. He has authored many books on Islam and comparative religion. Peace TV. And I'm sure there are hundreds of millions of people watching this very program on Peace TV. And I take this opportunity to welcome them on behalf of the organizers here in Mumbai. Yes, Peace TV is his brainchild and it has become his most far-reaching unmitigated and impactful phenomena worldwide in creating a better awareness of Islam and removing misconceptions about Islam. The ever increasing, this very over 100 million avid viewers of Peace TV worldwide are evolving into a mass base of defenders of the true, just and peaceful Islamic message for humanity at large and they're challenging the negative stereotyping of Islam and Muslims by some powerful corporate media and vested interest worldwide. Today's evening session has exclusively been reserved only for the open question and answers with Dr. Zakir Naik called Ask Dr. Zakir. Feel free, feel confident, feel at your right to ask questions to Dr. Zakir that you dare not ask others for fear of being ridiculed or blamed for criticizing Islam. I, Dr. Muhammad Naik, am your host and coordinator, inshallah, fair and caring too, for this session, in which is enshrined your right to ask Dr. Zakir and his duty to answer to the best of his knowledge and understanding Brothers and sisters, to answer your questions in this exclusive session, please welcome Dr. Zakir Naik. 
Before we start, may I kindly request our large audience collected here to kindly maintain the due decorum this program deserves. The rules for the question and answer session is, you may ask any question on Islam and comparative religion. Your question should be brief and to the point. Only one question at a time may be asked by you. For your second question, you would have to go back and line up again in the queue and await your chance. We have microphones placed in various sections in our audience. There are five microphones, three for the gents and two for the ladies section. One microphone is there just in front of the gents section and the other two in the rare sections. You may line up at any of the microphones, that's for the gents. And we have two microphones here for the ladies, one in the front and one in the rear section. Non-Muslims will be given preference to ask questions first, and if time permits, Muslim brothers and sisters would, inshallah, be offered their chance. Volunteers at the mics are requested to kindly and firmly ensure the same. The questioners are kindly requested to please state your name clearly as well as your profession before putting forward your question so that Dr. Zakir can give you a more appropriate answer. May I request Dr. Zakir to please present his initial comments for one or two minutes before we start the session. Dr. Zakir Naik. Alhamdulillah. Wassalatu wassalam. Al Rasulillah wa ala ali wa sahibi ajmain amma baad. A'udhu billahi minash shaitani rajeem. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Udhu ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah. Wal mu'azid al-hasna. Wajadun billati hasan. Rabbi shali sadri. Wa silli amri. Wa halul ugdatum min lisani yafkaw kawli. My respected elders and my brothers and sisters. I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. There have been requests since several years that since normally I give a talk for approximately one hour to one and a half hour and the question and answer session goes for more than two to two and a half hours. There was a request always by people for many years that why don't you have an exclusive only question and answer session so that the audience at least they are satisfied in quenching the thirst. So on the request and public demand, this year we thought, let's have one evening, at least more than three hours, only for question and session. So on the request of the various audiences that we have had, this is the first time we'll be having an exclusive question and session. And as the coordinator has mentioned, that first we'd like to give chance to the non-Muslims. So I request my non-Muslim brothers and sisters that if you have any questions regarding Islam and comparative religion, if you have any query, if you have any misunderstanding, even if you do not agree with a single teaching of Islam, this is the opportunity to question. And inshallah, I'm young, I can take your questions, and I'll try my level best with the limited knowledge that I have, that I'll try and reply to your questions. So I request the Muslim brothers and sisters to first give the chance to our non-Muslim brothers and sisters and after they have quenched their thirst we would allow the Muslim brothers and sisters. Jazakallah shukran. If the questioners are ready at the mic, we'll start. We have one mic in the front for the gents there, one in the middle and one in the rear section. Three, if you can see, first, second, third. For the ladies, we have one mic in the center right in front of me. For the ladies and one on the right hand side. Both are in the front. Uh, may we start with the first question on the mic on my left. Uh, yeah, Dr. Naik, uh, first let me just say I'm really honored to be standing in front of you. I've watched your programs on Peace TV a lot and I really think you're great. Can we have so, your name? Yeah, my name is Mahesh Ursekar and I am a PhD student in the Department of Philosophy of Mumbai University. Uh, my question is a little technical. Uh, I would like to know what the concept of soul is in Islam. As you know, in a lot of Indian philosophy, soul and mind are taken as different, whereas in Western philosophy, soul and mind is considered as the same. 
So uh, my first question is, what is the concept of soul in uh, Islam? And the second question is, what is the relationship of the soul to the body? So that after death, uh, you know, does the soul leave the body? And, uh, you know, uh, things like that. So there is a two-part question. What is the concept of the soul and how is it related to the body? And what happens to it after death? Thank you. Brother Mahesh has asked the question that what is the concept of soul in Islam and what is the relationship of the soul and the human body and what will happen to the soul after death? That's the basic question. That's correct. As far as the soul is concerned, the soul is the essence of the human body. The main importance as compared to the other creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, creation of Almighty God, the major difference in the human being, it is the soul. And it is the essence which will remain even after a person dies, which I'll discuss later on. As far as science is concerned, science does not speak about soul. Science hasn't reached that level where it can decipher what is the exact essence of the soul. But there have been researches done that when any living creature dies, for example, animal when he dies, as compared to a human being, when an animal dies, immediately after it dies, there's no difference in the weight. But when we analyze the weight of a human being, the moment he dies and he seizes life, immediately there's loss of weight. That means there is something that the human being is losing the moment he dies. But science hasn't reached that level so far to decipher what exactly soul. Soul is the essence of the human being. And the Quran says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 185, Allah says, Kullu Every soul shall have a taste of death. In this world, this life is the test for the hereafter. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 2, that Allah has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. So this life is a test for the hereafter. And every soul shall have a taste of death. Once a person dies, his soul is not there. But on the day of judgment, when he'll be resurrected, then depending upon the good deeds and the bad deeds he has done, Almighty God, on the day of judgment, he is Malik Ramadin. He is the master of the day of judgment. Depending upon how you have failed the test in this world, depending on that, then your result will be whether you go to paradise or hell. So the soul lives. Soul doesn't die. It only has a taste of death when a person body lies. So the relationship with the body and soul put together, you have the human being here. But in the year after, there will be absolutely a new body given and the soul will survive. And then, depending upon how he has fed the test, he will go to heaven or hell. Hope that answers the question. Is the soul the same as the mind? But that was the question that, is the soul same as the mind? No. Again, mind is abstract. If I ask you, where is your mind? So we will say, okay, fine, you know, mind, is it in the brain? So this is an abstract word, like how you say, mind your own business. So mind, when we say people start thinking of the brain, but that doesn't mean that the mind is in the brain, but it is different. So, mind is again an abstract word. I do not know where the mind is placed. But when we talk about the mind, normally we start thinking about the brain, but that's an abstract word. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. Yes, brother. Hello, my name is Mahesh Mehta. I am a retired person. I visited 15 Islamic countries, Salah area for main Women are different everywhere. Even Masjid and Navvi, Salah area for men and women is different. Karbala, Najaf, Kajmen, Samra, Damascus, Masar, men and women, Salah area are different. But during the Hajj times, Mina, Muzdilfa, Arafat, Safa, Marwa, and when doing Tawaf of Kaaba Sarif, men and women are together, and Dome of the Rock, and Al-Aqsa Masjid, Betul Mukaddas, in Jerusalem, men and women are together. Why? But the Mahesh Mehta asked a good question. And we know Mahesh Mehta since several years, since the conception of IRF. MashaAllah, he's the person who's a non-Muslim who used to take video cassettes when we started in 1991, and maximum cassettes he has taken. And I feel that he has seen more cassettes of IRF than any other Muslim also. He has asked the question that when he has been to many mosques throughout the world, 
most of the places, the prayer area for men and women, it is separate. But when he went to Hajj, and when he went to Makkah and Mina, Muzdalifah, the prayer area is the same and men and women are mixed and separate. What brother fails to realize that everywhere, even in Makkah and in Muzdalifah and Mina, the prayer area is same. But because of the situation, for example, when we go to Makkah, and there, one of the important pillars is you do tawaf. Now, when you do tawaf, you can't have separate area for tawaf. That is the reason while doing tawaf, we can't have separate spaces. But after they finish tawaf, normally men and women have got different designated areas, even in Makkah. But while they are doing tawaf, if the salah time takes place, some women may not reach the designated place. So there are occasions when they stand in areas which are not designated for the women. So because of this, there are occasions when we find, when we see, there may be some women mixed up in the gent area. But ideally, you see, when you come at the rear side, not at the mutaf, at the other part, you find that there's separate designated area for the women and separate for the men. In normal mosques that we have, the entry gates of men and women is separate. In haram, there are separate areas even for women to enter. But because when they go for tawaf, there's bound to be that they mix. But when they pray, they're supposed to be at different areas. But because the time may not permit them to reach the area, there are occasions when you may find that there may be certain mixing on certain areas. Same thing in Mina. Same thing in Muzdalifah. Even in Muzdalifa and Mina, you will never find men and women standing in the same row. Because they are scattered, it's a very big area. Because they come with their families. Same when they come for the Haram, in Makkah they come with their family. So here, because they come with family, to have separate segregation, suppose it's maybe 100 acres, so half for gents, half for ladies, then the family cannot stay together. In all the other mosques, because the mosque is small, you can easily have separate area for Salah, separate for entry, separate for exit, and they can meet their family outside. Here, because Muzdalifah, Arafat is hundreds of acres, and the family come together to do Hajj, while they stay in Arafat, Mina, Muzdalifah. So at that time, even when they pray, men and women don't stand in the same row. There is a separate area, but the areas are scattered. Because of that, it may not look that they are separate. But if you go to Masjid al Khaif, that's in Mina, or in Arafat, Masjid al Namra. There, there is separate segregation, just like any other mosque. Because when they pray in a large gathering, in a large area, it is difficult when families come together. Otherwise, always men and women, they are supposed to be separate, separate but equal facility. Why? The reason is so that they can concentrate on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala better and there's no intermingling of sexes. Hope that answers the question, brother. We can have the question from the ladies section, yeah. First one. Assalamu alaikum, bhai aur bairnao ko. I am Sangeetika Shah, teacher. My question is that one non-Muslim man can do the worship of Allah, but a married non-Muslim woman can do the worship of Allah. So, how can it be solved? And the Muslim community has done what for it? Thank you. Sister, that is the question that for an adult Muslim man, it's easy to do ibadah, easy to pray. But for a Muslim adult woman who's married, it's difficult to do ibadah, there can be difficulties. So what is the reason? As far as salah is concerned, the duty of salah and the ibadah is the same for the man and woman. And I discussed this one week back when I gave the talk on women's rights in Islam, protected or subjugated. And Quran clearly states, in Surah Azab, chapter number 33, verse number 35, Inna al Muslimina wal Muslimati, for Muslim men and women, wal Mu'minina wal Mu'minati, for believing men and women, wal Qanitina wal Qanitati, for devout men and women, wal Sadiqina wal Sadiqati, for true men and women, wal Sabirina wal Sabirati, for men and women who are patient and constant, wal Khashiina wal Khashiati, for men and women who humble themselves. 
So here we realize that this verse of the Quran, it is talking about for Muslim women, for believing women, for women who are devout, for women who are true, for women who have sabr, for men and women who pray. So it is the same. The duty, the spiritual duty of men and women in Islam is the same. But I do know there are occasions when the woman is undergoing a cycles, when she's undergoing a menstrual cycles, there is relaxation given to her. That because of the various psychological changes that take place, the various hormonal changes that take place because of the menstrual cycle, there is a concession given to women that during this time she should not pray. She is giving rest. So during these few days, during a cycle, there's relaxation that she should not pray. Same with the fast. She should not fast, but the fast can be compensated because in Ramadan you fast only for one month. But since you have to offer salah five times a day, every day of your life, it need not be covered up. So this is a concession given so that it is much more beneficial and she's comfortable. Hope that answers the question, sister. Yes, brother. Before posing my question, uh, I would like to thank the organizers for making such a brilliant and stupendous effort. Now, coming to my question, I have a lot of interaction with Muslims because my early childhood and uh, youth was spent among them. But one question has always uh, been not really understood by me, the definition of Allah. Because to my mind and the way it has been given to me by my Muslim friends and acquaintances, that their definition of Allah basically is negation of other faiths and also non-acceptance of their definition of God as such. Your scholarship is very profound. I would like to be benefited by it. I was asked a very good question, very important question, that he wants to know one thing which has been always in his mind, what is the definition of Allah in Islam? And the definition also includes many things which is negation and it contradicts the definition of the other faiths. In fact, in Islam, the definition of Allah says what Allah is and also says what Allah is not. Besides knowing what God is, it is also important to know what God is not. So that if someone falsely claims that so-and-so is God, you can easily come to know this is a false claim. As far as the reply to what is the definition of Allah, the best reply that any Muslim can give you is from the Quran, from Surah Ikhlas, chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4, which says, Kul ho Allahu ahad. Say he is Allah one and only. Allahu samad. Allah, the absolute and eternal. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He begets not, nor is he begotten. Walam yakul lahu kuffanad. There is nothing like him. This is a four line definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God, given in the glorious Quran. This is the touchstone of theology. It is the litmus test to identify any person says so and so candidate is God. If that candidate fits in this four line definition, we Muslims have got no objection in accepting that candidate to be God. The first is, Qul hu Allah ahad. Say it's Allah one and only. Allah samad. Allah the absolute and eternal. Lam yulad walam yulad. He begets not nor is he begotten. Walam yakul lahu kufanad. There is nothing like him. For example, I'll give you an example. There are some human beings who say that Bhagawan Rajneesh is God. During question and answer time, there was a Hindu brother who told me that if Hindus don't consider him to be God. I never said that the Hindus call Bhagawan Rajneesh to be God. There are many human beings who claim Bhagawan Rajneesh is God. Now I will give you a sample. Why do we use this negative also? Like say is Allah one and only is positive. Allah samat, Allah the absolute eternal. Lam yalad wa lam yulad. He begets not nor is he begotten. Why do we use this? Now we'll put this Bhagawan Rajneesh to test. The first test is, Qul huwa Allah huwad. Say is Allah one only. Was Bhagawan Rajneesh one and only? Was he the only man who has claimed divinity? There are hundreds who have claimed divinity. And in this country of ours, India, there are thousands of men who have claimed divinity. Thousands of people have said that they are God. He's not the only one. But Rajneesh Bhakt will say, no, Bhagawan Rajneesh is unique. So let's go to the next test. Allah who samad. Allah the absolute and eternal. Was Rajneesh absolute and eternal? When we read his autobiography, we read there that Bhagwan Rajneesh, he was suffering from asthma, from diabetes mellitus, from chronic backache. Imagine Almighty God suffering from asthma, 
from diabetes mellitus, from chronic backache. The third test, lam yulis va lam yulis. He begets not noise begotten. We know Bhagavad Nish Nish. He was born in Madhya Pradesh. And he had a mother and father. And in 1981, he goes to America and takes thousands of Americans for a ride. And in the state of Oregon, he starts his new center known as Rajnishpuram. Later on, the American government arrests him and puts him behind bars. Rajnish alleges that the American government gave me slow poisoning. Imagine Almighty God being slow poisoned. And 1985, the American government kicking out of the country, he comes back to India and goes back to the city of Pune. And there, he goes and restarts his center, which is today called as Osho Commune. And if you visit Osho Commune today, if you go to a Samadhi, where his ashes have been kept after he died, it is mentioned over there on a Samadhi, on a stone, Osho, Bhagwan Rajnish, Osho, never born, never died, but visited the earth from the 11th of December, 1931, to the 19th of January, 1990. Never born, never died, but visited the earth from the 11th of December, 1931 to the 19th of January, 1990. They forgot to mention on his Samadhi that he was not given visas to 21 different countries of the world. Imagine Almighty God coming on this earth to visit different countries and requires visas. And the last test, Walam Yakulla Kufanad, is so stringent that the moment you can compare God to anything in this world, He is not God. Walam Yakulla Kufanad. We know Bhagavan Rajnish. He had a white beard. Like the human being, they had two eyes, one nose, one mouth, two hands. The moment you can compare God to anything in this world, He is not God. For example, someone says that the Almighty God is thousand times stronger than Arnold Schwarzenegger. You may have heard the name of Arnold Schwarzenegger, the person who got the title Mr. World, strongest man in the world, Mr. Universe, the strongest man in the universe. The moment you can compare God to anything in this world, whether it be Anil Swashnigar, Dara Singh or King Kong, whether it be a thousand times or a million times, the moment you can compare God to anything in this world, He is not God. Walam yakul lauku fanat.